Um, next up, we have Rainer Jung with monitoring Apache Tomcat and the Apache web server. Please give him applause. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, the topic is about uh, monitoring, and the two products are coming from different technological worlds. One is uh, written in C, one in Java. So the means of monitoring differ, but the metrics um, are quite similar. And I will concentrate on the metrics, on the data that's available, not how to actually retrieve the data. I will say a few words about retrieving, but more about um, what kind of information is there and why it could be interesting. So first of all, the agenda, I give you a short motivation, what I mean by monitoring and why I think um, uh, more data is interesting than typically is collected. Um, then I will um, talk a little bit about JMX, JMX but um, before going into JMX, I will just um, let you raise your hands who already knows about JMX, so probably we can skip a, a, a bit of it. I will ask later. Um, and then some short remarks, and then um, there's uh, the, the biggest part is about Apache Tomcat, which metrics are available, and then um, similar metrics um, for the Apache web server, and hopefully we'll have time for some discussion. So for the motivation, typically um, the main goal of monitoring is failure detection, um, red-green statues, alarms, notification. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, this only works in, um, for very specific components and very specific situations. Um, we usually do not want false positives. Uh, in the middle of the night, getting a call because of, false, of a false positive is not nice. Um, uh, but um, these um, goals can only be reached for simple things like um, file system, um, free percentage, CPU busy, or end-to-end -end, um, checkable things like logins, transactions, and so on. Um, I think it's uh, important um, to collect additional metrics um, even if there's no way of putting a threshold on them or if there's no way of um, letting, letting them fire um, a notification uh, in case of a failure. Um, such metrics typically um, should be uh, polled in regular intervals, um, stored, um, accumulated over time and visualized in advance. Why do I think it's important? Um, such metrics are typically used um, um, in case of problems to analyze the root cause after the fact. Um, if you do not have any data collected in advance, then you have to wait for the next um, time the problem happens and prepare then to collect data. So it's a good idea to um, do it from the beginning. Also, um, many of these data um, help to do um, a good capacity management. So what kind of metrics um, are we looking for? I'm looking for metrics that um, give information about application load and response times, about utilization of software components like pools and caches, about utilization of resources, uh, in the Java case especially about memory and garbage collection behavior. Uh, what um, I will focus in this talk is what's readily available in Tomcat and um, the Apache web server. So I'm not talking about your um, application specific stuff. I'm also not talking about log file monitoring. Um, things that we typically do not get from um, the usual monitoring um, is information whether, for instance, the application is fine, but it's waiting for another system, for a backend, for a database, um, whether it's waiting to acquire logs, um, whether we are looping in code. Um, so this is, uh, these are er types of errors um, that we um, would not detect with that kind of monitoring. In the Java world, one would use threat dumps, but that's um, enough material for another talk. So let's um, have a sh short introduction to JMX to get you uh, acquainted with the basic terminology. Give me a hand, who knows about JMX? It's about half of the people, so um, I should not skip the whole block, but, but maybe I can go through it a little faster. The, the slides will be available after the talk. So JMX, um, Java Management Extensions, is a standard in the Java world. Um, it can be used to expose internal application states um, to the outside. Um, typical um, uh, such states are sizes of pools, counters, request counters, error counters, also configuration settings. Um, the data can be uh, a list of scalars, but it can also be 
uh, structured in nested um, data structures. Um, in addition, JMX also supports um, operations, for instance, resetting statistics or, or changing configuration, and it um, supports um, sending out notifications. Um, I will focus on uh, metrics uh, that are available and interesting for monitoring. Um, the data typically is grouped uh, in objects called M-beans. Um, uh, the M always stands for management uh, in JMX. Um, the M-beans um, have a name. The name is structured. It's called an object name. And apart from the name, they have a list of attributes. And that's where the data sits. Um, a simple example is um, uh, on the lower part of the slide. There you can see the name starts, uh, in this case, with the uh, term Catalina. And you might have seen that term um, uh, showing up uh, around Tomcat uh, lots of time. We will later see where this Catalina here in the name comes from. And then after the, and, and this part of the name in front of the column, it's called the domain. It's the major grouping of M beans. Um, and then we have a list of um, key equals value uh, pairs. In this case, we have a type uh, thread pool, we have a name, so there could be many thread pools and we can distinguish them. And uh, below we have a list of attributes like uh, current thread count 10 and so on. So that's a, a basic view of an M bean. Now, um, how do we get access to the MBeans? MBeans um, are always registered um, with an MBean server. That's the registry of MBeans. And they are registered under their name. So the object name of the MBean is important. Typically, in a running JVM, there is only one MBean server. But um, in some situations, there can be multiple. Typically, for Tomcat, there's only one MBean server. Um, each running Java process um, already contains an MBean server and um, a not short list of MBeans. We will see those MBeans um, very soon. So um, even without having a Tomcat in the Java process or having your application, there is already a couple of MBeans that provide interesting data. Um, for Tomcat, uh, there is an additional list of MBeans, um, and um, an application developer could easily um, provide own monitoring information via custom MBeans, and that's a good thing to do. So now, typically in monitoring, we want to do remote access. Um, um, uh, one way to do it is um, using Java as a client, because Java knows how to um, access JMX, JMX over the network. Um, uh, to enable this, one has to use um, a couple of system properties um, to allow um, remote access. I gave the URL where you can read about it. Um, caution, if you do it for production systems, always enable access control because, as I said, JMX does not, all, all, does not only provide uh, metrics, it also allows to call operations. So um, who can connect to JMX might be able to do things to your running processes that you don't want, so use access control there. Um, JMX um, does have a couple of problems with firewalls because it uses dynamic ports. In the case of Tomcat, I gave another link. There is a workaround um, where you can make sure that only ports are used um, that are open in your firewalls. OK. A um, couple of examples, um, uh, there is a, a well-known um, JMX client that's called JVisualVM, and um, JVisualVM is not about monitoring, it's an interactive GUI, um, so you wouldn't use it in an enterprise um, scale, but it's a nice tool to have a first look at which MBeans are there, how do the data look, do I understand the data, uh, before you start to configuring um, your monitoring system to um, pull the stuff automatically. JVisualVM comes, comes uh, with the Oracle JDK, and um, I will show a, a short demo just um, so that you have an idea that um, it's interesting to look at it. Um, there is lots of JMX clients. Um, I gave one totally other uh, different example, JMX term. It's an interactive shell-like access um, to JMX. And probably all monitoring solutions allow integration of JMX. So let's have a very short uh, look at um, JVisual VM. Um, I already started it and now the question is, I will have a, uh, I will make it uh, bigger in a moment. Um, so 
let me, the first Java process, oops, the first Java process I will um, use is doing nothing else than just sleeping for five minutes and then exiting. So it, there is no uh, application code uh, apart from the sleeping in there. So I started a class sleep and it shows up here and when I have the tab open, I can make it bigger. Let's see whether that works. Yeah. So is this readable? Yeah? Okay. So what we see is um, that um, JVisual VM attached um, to this running Java process and it um, shows us um, a view of all the MBNs available, and they are grouped here by domain. Remember, there was this domain part in front of the column, which was Catalina in the Tomcat case, and here we have um, a few names that sound more like basic Java stuff. Most of the MBNs that are there always are um, underneath java.lang, and we will come back to these MBNs um, very um, soon. I will just um, give you um, an impression that um, it's very easy to um, explore them. You can open them, and then and you, you see the list of attributes and you see the values. So you can go through, through this very easily and um, get an idea um, how this works. Note that um, the first time you start JVisual VM, it will not show the MBNs. There is a plugin concept and a menu that says um, you can activate additional plugins. And by default, one of the plugins that's available is for MBNs. And um, if you activate it and restart JVisual VM, then it will show you the MBN information. So, oops, let's return to the normal size and to our presentation. Okay, so um, a couple of remarks about um, JMX um, clients. Um, the very basic monitoring setups um, often use a simple shell script that um, each time you pull data starts a Java process that connects via JMX and retrieves the data. And that's a no-go because that doesn't scale. It's uh, much too expensive to, to start a Java process each time you pull data. Um, so um, you need a kind of persistent JMX client. Um, there is another way of doing it, especially um, because we are now talking about um, Tomcat. Um, we could run a, an agent inside Tomcat that um, has in-process access to the JMX data and from the outside um, can be uh, contacted via HTTP. So then um, the basic technologies we can use on the client side are uh, much more flexible and um, all the um, JMX part of it uh, will be contained in the uh, Tomcat Java process. Another solution, but I will not go in depth here, um, would be running a proxy somewhere. So running a persistent Java process that could be contacted from the client and relays um, the requests um, to the target um, JVM. So some remarks before we actually go through the MBNs that are available. Um, it's important to take the measurement automatically and not simply using JVisual VM. This is only for ad hoc inspection, finding out what's available. Um, typical poll interval for the data that I present should be around one minute, one, once per minute. Um, in addition um, to uh, polling and persisting, of course, we need to think about thresholds, and I tried to add um, the word threshold um, to each uh, metric where I think um, thresholds could be reasonably set. Um, data that you collect should be visualized because um, looking at long rows of numbers typically gives, don't, wouldn't give you the right impression what's happening. Um, the second thing, um, often MBNs contain um, only scalar um, data. And that's good because it's easy to support for all tools. We will um, uh, soon see that some of the platform MBNs uh, in the JVM, some of the MBNs that are always there, 
um, use nested data. And um, the problem is that you have to make sure that your tool chain supports um, nested data in, in, in ambience. So if your developers think about adding ambience um, to your applications themselves, they should um, th uh, think twice whether um, the tools you're using for monitoring actually support the use of structured data. Um, MBINs, unfortunately, they typically reflect the source code structure. Um, so they are grouped somehow close to the classes they are used in, in, in the code. This granularity is not always uh, optimal, and um, if we have many instances uh, of objects, then often we have many MBINs. Um, so this might mean that uh, if we want to retrieve the data, um, we had to do many polls. If we retrieve data for one MBIN each time, and we want to get the data um, from 20, then we would have to do 20 polls. It would be much more efficient if the tool supported um, some bulk operation, so retrieving data for a given set of MBINs at once. Um, what is typically not clever is retrieving all anything from the MBIN server and then filtering on the client side, because that could trigger unwanted side effects um, on the server side. For instance, if you do it with a WebLogic server running, then every time you do it, it will create a full thread dump of the WebLogic server. And another thing, um, the data is not always um, uh, in, uh, uh, given in a way that is directly useful. Sometimes we have to apply simple mathematical operations on the data. For instance, if the data is a counter since startup, um, then this is not useful. We have to, um, for instance, look at the delta since uh, last time we, we retrieved it, or at the rates, how, how much did it change per second in the last interval. Sometimes we need to do quotients of data or even quotients of deltas. Now, let's, now it's enough of uh, theory. Let's have a look um, at Tomcat. First of all, um, I'm not going to use um, a Java client. I'm going to use a very simple uh, way of um, retrieving and presenting the data. Uh, and this is uh, a way that's built in in Tomcat. Um, it's a servlet that's part of the Tomcat Manager web application. It's called the JMX proxy. It's not very powerful, but for just simply retrieving the data, it's not that bad, actually. Um, just to, to give you um, uh, another option, there is a, another web app uh, called Jolokia that's also available for Tomcat and other um, application servers and web containers. Um, Jolokia returns the data in form of JSON serialization. And there is a, a client, that there are various clients for Jolokia uh, providing JavaScript APIs, uh, Perl APIs, uh, and also interactive APIs. So that's another way that's not bundled. It's also open source, but it's not part of Tomcat. So we start with platform MBINs. These are the ones that are available in every JVM, not just in Tomcat. First platform MBIN, operating system MBIN. Um, I uh, do not show the full data because um, I think I omitted everything that's that's uh, totally irrelevant to monitoring. Maybe I will show a little um, that's not really relevant, but I tried to omit everything that's totally irrelevant. Um, so from the operating system MBIN, um, the number in red, it says process CPU time. It's a pretty huge number. Um, that was um, shortly after starting uh, the process, actually. Um, how, much, how could it take that much CPU time? Be careful, this is in nanoseconds. Okay, so if you retrieve uh, a metric, think twice whether you really know what the unit is, whether you found some documentation for it or not. Um, this uh, MBIN provides also system load average. Um, it provides uh, lots of numbers about um, the process and the system memory, uh, but not fine-grained in the Java world. It's more the look from the outside, from the operating system level. And it provides access to numbers of open file descriptors and maximum open file descriptors. Um, Concerning the process CPU time, what could we do with the process CPU time? Obviously, it's a counter. It will always go up. So um, per se, it's not very useful. But uh, think what would it be if we take the rate change of process CPU time over time? CPU time over time. What would, what would the unit be? Yeah, CPU time would be seconds or milliseconds over time divided by seconds. So the, it, it has no unit. 
It's just a scalar. And what is it? What is it? It's um, the, the average um, CPU concurrency in the last measurement interval. So it's roughly how many cores were used. Yeah, and that's, a, that's an interesting number. Then um, we've got the system load average, and here um, it's the, the usual one minute average um, that's provided by any Unix type system, for instance. Um, the committed virtual memory size, um, typically you only look at the Java internal sizes, but um, if you're using Java native parts uh, and uh, probably uh, have some memory leaks there, then you can uh, use this one to track uh, whether restart is actually soon needed or not. And uh, the maximum file descriptor count, I think many um, uh, ran into the problem that uh, uh, for some reason uh, the, the, um, the limit of the file descriptor count was not big enough and you had to readjust it. Um, there is actually a way of tracking how many open file descriptors are there so that you um, can easily get an alarm uh, when you uh, approach the limit. Runtime, runtime MBIN, um, the only more or less useful item it has is the uptime, so you can track when um, the last restart was. The threading MBIN, it um, gives you information about how many threads um, are in your process. Uh, not only currently, it also has a peak count, and it also shows you um, how many um, threads have been started. So again, by using the rate, you can see how many threads per second you were starting. Two MBINs that I think are not that interesting, um, I would typically not monitor them, but it's good to know that they are available in case one has a very specific problem. One of it monitors class loading. Typically, it sooner or later gets stable, so there's no more, no more interesting stuff to see. Um, it's not true if um, you start running um, uh, dynamic languages in the JVM, then it might be that a lot of classes get um, generated dynamically and you probably might run into a problem because there's too much class loading activity and then it's actually useful um, that one could monitor the activity. Compilation is about the hotspot compiler, so the um, on-the-fly compilation of uh, methods um, into um, uh, um, assembler code. So, next one, memory. Um, this one only has heap and non-heap memory usage, and that's not very useful because if you know about Java memory and garbage collection tuning, then you know that you cannot look at the memory as one big block. It's divided in several parts and you have to individually control what's happening. So this one um, typically I would not use, but there is a memory pool MBIN and that, uh, this MBIN is available for the individual memory regions. So again, it's not a talk about Java memory and garbage collection tuning, but you might have heard the terminology, there is a need in space, survivor spaces, tenured, permanent, and each of those spaces have one memory pool MBIN. And this MBIN um, you can use to track um, the usage and the peak usage. It also um, has information about the usage after the last gar garbage collection. Um, it's the collection usage uh, item, the last in, in the list, but for this you would better use the next uh, MBIN, it's the garbage collector MBIN. And um, typically um, people think, are thinking they have one garbage collector in their um, JVM, but in most cases um, it's two, it's one garbage collector that collects Eden and one garbage collector that um, is responsible for the tenured space. So we might have more than one of these MBINs. Um, and um, they provide information about how many garbage collections have been happening since startup, so you can have, again, the rate. Um, the um, cumulated um, uh, duration that these um, garbage collections took, um, and um, uh, when the last uh, collection started, ended, and how long the last collection took. So if you run into memory problems, there is some data readily available there. Also, there are two items, memory usage before and after GC, um, which I will show on the next slide. Um, those, again, uh, have one entry per memory region, and it shows um, the same quadruple of data that we, have, that we had in the uh, memory pool MBINs. Okay, that's the platform MBINs. So just to recall, there's operating system that's about CPU, 
um, uh, complete uh, pro uh, total process memory file descriptors. Um, we have uh, lots of MBNs about uh, um, uh, memory and garbage collection, and we have an MBN about um, total thread counts. That's th these are the most important ones. Let's look inside Tomcat. Um, inside Tomcat, the first MBN that I um, uh, 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 will present is the thread pool MBN. So um, Tomcat um, has um, the notion of connectors. The connectors use thread pools um, to serve um, uh, requests that come in over connections. And of course, every time you have a pool, it's uh, important to control whether the sizing is good, whether this pool is exhausted, or whether you, you, you could shrink it actually, or whether you would need to um, increase it. So um, the thread pool MBN uh, provides the information about the current size of the thread pool. That's the thread count. And uh, it also provides the information how many busy uh, threads are in there. Um, what is busy depends on the connector you're using. For the um, old-style blocking I.O. connector, whenever a connection is connected to Tomcat, it blocks one thread, and this is then a busy thread. For the newer NIO and APR connectors, a thread is only busy um, when it's actually working on a request. The uh, quotient between the busy threads and the max threads um, would give you the thread pool usage in, in, in percent. How many percent of the thread pool are currently busy? So it's easy to put a threshold on there. Um, then we've got a global request processor. The global request processor uh, counts uh, requests um, for the whole of Tomcat. So any request that's served by Tomcat will be counted in the request count. Um, it also accumulates the processing time. So the time it took to handle the request will be summed up. Uh, it shows the maximum time and also some data about traffic going in and going out. The request count as a counter is not interesting in itself, but again, um, deriving a rate over time gives you the throughput of your application, how many requests per second are being handled. And uh, another thing, um, there is an error count, but of course, these are only errors um, that can be uh, noticed by Tomcat. This is not like my user provided a wrong password during login. That's not an error in, in the sense of Tomcat. So um, you have to be careful to overestimate um, what the meaning of error count uh, actually is. Um, the processing time, it's cumulated, as I said, in milliseconds. What can we do with it? Um, if we take the rate, we get the average processing time of requests in the last sample interval. If we... Um, so, sorry, uh, no, again, again. Um, what do we get? If we take the rate of the processing time, again, the game is what's the unit? It's processing time, so it's seconds divided by seconds. It has no unit. What does it mean? It's the average concurrency um, that was in place during the last uh, interval. So if the result is 10, it would mean on average in the last minute, 10 requests were processed in parallel. What we could also do, we could do um, dividing um, the delta of the processing time by the delta of the request count. And this would give us the average response time in the last interval. So this is something that people sometimes um, derive from access logs or things like this by passing it. But you could also really um, very simply do it um, by retrieving some scalars and doing the right mathematical operations. Of course, this is global. This does not. Um, uh, this, from the access log, you can, you can choose the URLs that you actually um, are interested in. This is um, putting all the requests in one counter. So then there is a request processor. Remember, this thing was called global request processor. The next one is a request processor. It's a totally different beast. Um, a request processor, more or less, um, is available, let's say, once per thread. And um, for monitoring purposes, it, probably it's not normal monitoring, but it's still interesting. What it shows is whether there is a request currently running and since, and, and since how long. So if you're interested in on-the-fly detection, whether you, are, whether you have long-running requests, um, you can um, retrieve the request processor data. And if there is a current URI 
item there. Then it's working on this URI, and the request processing time will show you since what time in milliseconds. So if this is a big number, you know you've got a request in the system that takes a long time. Data source, if you configure your data source, um, so um, a, thread, uh, a connection pool for a database inside um, Tomcat, then Tomcat also provides some monitoring data. Um, you can see um, the number of um, active and idle connections and the, the maximum number that you allow. So by division, you can um, retrieve the percentage, um, how many of the possible connections are in use currently. So those are more or less global Tomcat specific mBeans. The next round is mBeans that Tomcat provides per web app. So more fine grained. The first of them is called manager. And now please don't confuse the manager mBean with the manager web application. The manager web application is a tool with, with, which we can use to deploy applications, to retrieve JMX data um, to um, uh, have a look at status information. The manager mBean is something very different. It provides information about session management. And since each web application has its own session management, there is one of those per web application. So this is um, a dump of the manager mBean for the root context. And it uh, shows us that um, we've got um, one, two, three, four sessions, but not currently active, created since Tomcat start. Again, by taking the rate, we can get an idea how many, se how many sessions per second we created during the last minute. Aha. Uh -huh. That, for instance, depending on how your application works, could be close to your login rate. And often logins are relatively expensive, and there is a problem at the morning, at night, when every, uh, at nine, when everybody comes in, that you get a performance problem. So you can measure how many session creations per time you have by doing monitoring. Um, the same uh, goes for the expired sessions. Um, this is the session destructions. Um, it counts logouts as well as expiration by, idle, by idleness. Both are counted in, in only one counter. And active sessions is the number of sessions that are currently uh, in use. Um, what else do we have? Um, uh, Max Active uh, will show us um, uh, the maximum um, uh, concurrent number of sessions that we had since restart. Obviously, a maximum is not that interesting because it will grow and grow and grow and grow, and it will never shrink. Um, but there is a way of um, resetting the maximum. So uh, if you're interested, for instance, in daily max maximum, um, you can um, reset it at midnight and then um, uh, always have the, the current day's maximum in there. Rejected and duplicates. Um, a rejected session uh, is a session that could not be created because you configured an upper limit on the allowed number of sessions. And um, the session that should be created was too much. And then it will be denied and will be counted in the rejected sessions. Um, duplicates um, is typically always zero. It would count whether um, a duplicate session ID would be generated. It would then not be used, the duplicate ID, but we can recount it. OK, then um, the uh, manager ambient is the only ambient that um, actually provides um, some rate type statistic um, itself. It has the average lifetime and the max lifetime. Um, and um, this is done um, by um, uh, using uh, the last 100 sessions um, that, uh, no, I'm wrong, that's the next page, sorry, sorry. Session average a lifetime and maximum a lifetime are statistics over the whole lifetime of um, the Tomcat process. Processing time doesn't have to do with request processing time. Until now, whenever I said processing time, it was cumulated time of how long did it take to handle requests. Processing time for the manager is how long did it took the manager to clear up um, idle sessions. Usually, this is not interesting in a small number, except when you register HTTP session listeners that do something complex. For instance, um, you need to log out from a backend system whenever a session goes away in your web application. So, so, so finally, you're doing a remote call, and this could, could be a performance problem. If you want to track how long session expiration takes, um, you can use the processing time of the manager app, uh, uh, manager uh, MBIN. 
Okay, so these is uh, the last two um, are rates that are provided by this MBIN, the create and the expire rate. Um, I usually take it from the create and expire counters by doing the rates myself. If you are not able to do that, um, um, some rates are provided here as a built-in feature um, and they are taken from the last 100 sessions created or expired. Okay, next thing, next thing, servlets. So inside the web app, we've got servlets. Um, for each servlet, there is an MBean, and um, the servlet name is uh, part of um, the object name of the MBean. We can see here, I took the JMX proxy servlet and looked at its own statistics. And uh, again, we can see the request count, how often was it called. We can see the accumulated processing time in milliseconds, from which we can again derive the average processing time in the last interval, the concurrency, and so on. Some um, servlets are notable. Um, there is always the default servlet. It delivers static content. So also the static content activity can be measured by um, simply monitoring the default servlet. There is another servlet that's called JSP servlet that's available for delivering JSPs. So also JSP activity can be measured. Then there are a few more numbers um, about JSPs. Um, we have counters about loaded and unloaded and reloaded JSPs. So if you're heavy on JSPs and need to track um, those numbers, or um, if you know you run into a problem once a certain number of JSPs um, have been reached, um, you can monitor this. Um, since sometime, I think Tomcat 7, I think we didn't have it in 6, I'm not sure, um, there is a feature um, to unload um, JSPs um, that haven't been used for a long time in case of a, a certain um, limit um, of uh, loaded JSPs is reached. Finally, there is um, one MBean um, for per web app, so not per servlet, per web app again, um, and this only provides the processing time and that's a bit strange. Why doesn't it provide the request count, the max time, the min time, and so on? It's just an omission. And um, since I noted this, uh, that uh, this is missing um, last night uh, uh, during Rich's talk, um, I added um, the other items. Um, so the next Tomcat 7 release will also have request count, max time, min time um, per web app. OK, that's a long list, but basically, Basically, um, we can track um, activity, request counts, we can track response times, we can track sessions, session creation, session destruction, we can track um, thread pool size uh, that's used. Um, uh, so that's um, all of the infrastructure that Tomcat itself provides. So let's go um, to the web server, totally different technological world in the sense of implementation language, but obviously it's all about, again, it's all about HTTP, request, response time, so um, from the point of view of metrics, there should be some similarities. Um, so first question is, um, how do we retrieve data? And in the Tomcat um, uh, uh, case, it was clear that we would use JMX. Um, the question is um, what to use um, in HTTP. And one easy way of retrieving data is using um, the server, the, the, the status module. And um, Rich in the previous talk already showed um, a couple of um, screenshots um, that are close to what I will be showing, but I will go more into detail about the data. So to provide the status module, that's usually always installed with the Apache. You have to load it and you have to um, uh, provide some um, URI, some location section, um, where you set the handler to server status. Which URI you're choosing, it's totally up to you. It doesn't have to be slash server minus status, uh, but please make sure that you provide an ex um, appropriate access control um, in case data that's shown there is uh, not supposed to be public. You will see in a minute uh, the kind of data that's there. There's also another way you could write a program that connects to the shared memory that's actually um, used for the data that the mod status um, uh, shows, but I will not go into depth um, for this. So the simple way is activating the status module and retrieving data over HTTP. Okay, so here's um, an example. And um, this is now um, from the time after we did the upgrade, um, and actually it's um, uh, from um, something like um, yesterday, um, running the latest version um, of the web server. 
Um, this page is rendered in HTML, so um, unfortunately one would need to pass the data out of the page. The data that's shown is interesting, I will go into detail soon, uh, and this view has the most complete data, but there are other views um, available. If we add a query parameter, question mark auto, then we get a textual view. And most of the data that's interesting in the HTML view is also in the auto view. Probably we should complete it if there is something interesting uh, missing. Obviously, this auto view is um, much more easier to pass. There is no HTML text and so on, so um, it's uh, trivial um, to, monitor, to, to um, pass the data out uh, and um, put them into your monitoring system. Then below this part with the numbers, there is a tabular tepu te te view. That this tabular view would show us what's happening on each thread of the Apache. And typically, that's not especially interesting for monitoring. It could be interesting if you're overloaded and you wonder which URLs it might be, from which IPs the data comes from, but this goes more into a more detailed analysis of the problem and not collecting metrical data that's, um, that has an easy structure. So the table is there, but you don't have to pass the table to get anything for your regular uh, monitoring. There is um, uh, a variant, um, if you add the question mark no table, then this table will be uh, not shown as an HTML table. Um, it will be um, that the columns will be given by, by appropriate separators, so again, it's easier to pass. But as I said, typically you don't need it for monitoring. So actually, what part of this information is interesting? Let's start from the beginning. First of all, on the top, we've got the restart time or the same information given in another form, the server uptime. Um, note that graceful restarts do not count as restarts. Then the next line gives us the server load. That's a very recent feature that's only available in 244. Um, and um, it's the same kind of data that you would get when running the uptime command on the system itself. It's the, the normal load command, the, the run queue length in the three different um, average intervals. Um, then the next thing is the total excesses. So in the Tomcat world, we would have named it request counter or request count. Here it's total excesses. It's the number of requests handled. And we have the total traffic. Um, so to make uh, something interesting out of it, we would take the rate uh, of both. So we would get the number of requests per second handled in the last measurement interval, last minute, and uh, the bandwidth uh, used um, for the traffic. If we take uh, the quotient of the deltas, we get the average um, response size um, during the last interval. So are we serving big content on average currently, or are we serving um, small content? Next thing, um, it tells us um, how many requests are currently being processed and how many idle worker threads workers are available. This is very similar to the thread pool MB in Tomcat. Um, the, the, the number of threads uh, made available for handling requests um, is um, the most important tuning um, uh, item. So uh, measuring uh, how, how many um, of the threads are in use um, is important to find out whether you actually um, have oversized uh, your server or whether you might need to provide uh, more threads every now and then. Then um, there is additional data that, in my opinion, is not that useful, the CPU usage. CPU usage is a bit um, hard because um, Apache uses several processes. So what does it mean that um, the, the uh, status module provides CPU data? Um, if you look there, you can see there is a U and a S. Um, that's um, the user and the system time. And then there is a CU and a CS. CU means child user and child system. And um, for instance, the Linux operating system um, has uh, a facility that if a child stops normally, then its um, CPU time, user and system CPU time, is carried over, is added to a child, sorry, child user and system CPU time field in the parent process. That means the parent can kind of track the accumulated CPU time, but only for the children that have already stopped, not for the children that are still running. 
Yeah? And that makes the, the numbers problematic. I usually they don't get much out of them. Um, also, uh, the request per second, megabytes per second, kilobytes per request, these are long time statistics since the last restart. So better use the counters and retrieve the numbers for the last interval yourself and don't use the long time statistics that kind of stabilize and even if something happens, um, the numbers won't change anymore because of statistical reasons. Okay, then um, there is this um, uh, line with, um, or m multiple lines with, with characters. What do they mean? The characters indicate what our um, threats are actually doing. Um, until now, we only had total number of busy worker threats, but what are they doing? Um, and um, by counting the characters, um, you can get an idea, and the most important characters are W, R, K, the underscore, and the dot. And um, don't try to remember what it is. The server status page contains um, a list, an explanation of the keys, and I pasted it here. So um, R means reading the request. So the Apache web server has not yet fully read the request. Yeah, it's still in the you know, phase of reading the request in. W means working or wor working on the request. Um, uh, that could be uh, the proxy waits for a backend to answer. That could be we serve a big content and we have a slow line to the, to the user and it just takes uh, a longer time to serve the content. The K, as Rich already um, explained, is the keep alive uh, status and um, the underscore is an idle slot. The dot means there could be a process running um, that would take up these slots, but there is none currently. Um, as Rich already explained, K was very frequently before we had, sorry, before we had the event uh, MPM. Uh, now the K is gone, mostly, and um, we can see um, where it went to. Um, when using the event MPM, there is another table in the same page, and this table gives us some insight what's happening apart from the worker threats. So the worker threats is the, the precious resource, but there is also uh, a lot of stuff happening apart from the worker threats, namely the Keep Alive connections, where we are just waiting for data to arrive, but we are just um, uh, polling uh, the connections whether there is some data or not. It could be we want to close the connection and need to drain remaining data, um, so we wait some time. So again, this is mostly an idle situation, although there is a connection related. It could be write completion. We are serving static com content. We already read it from disk, but the client doesn't, doesn't take it very quickly, so we have to block every now and then uh, before we can send the next chunk. Um, all these um, situations are now no longer handled with the worker threats, but in an asynchronous way. And to read the little table, um, all the rows that start with a, with a um, process number, process ID, um, uh, are per process uh, uh, statistics. And finally, in the last row, we have the sum. Typically for the monitoring, we are only interested in the sum. Only once, once we have a real problem, need to analyze, then we might look into the details. But let's look at the sum. And what are the columns? The first column tells us just how many connections overall we are currently holding in the web server. The second tells us something about the worker threats, namely how many are busy and how many are idle. The third column tells us something about the connections that they are, they are not blocking a worker thread. They are in some other situation that we can handle much more efficiently. And there we have the write completion, keep alive, and the closing state. And how do those sum up? Typically, you would have the busy ones plus the write completion plus the keep alive plus the, cl the closing state is the same number as the total number of connections. Each connection should be in one of those states. Okay, um, I would um, suggest um, to monitor the threats uh, and the async data. Um, the other data, I think, is for monitoring not that important. Okay, that's the end of the talk. So um, we've got some time for discussion. Uh, ah, uh, I also brought with me some pictures we can look at, but um, uh, probably um, uh, I'd like first to check whether we've got um, questions. And if we don't have any questions, we can uh, look at a couple of pictures of monitoring data. Okay. 
So questions? Um, I know as a Tomcat developer, you're probably biased, but uh, what do you typically use to monitor Tomcat as an interface? <sighs> yeah, okay. Um, I'm not an operations guy. I do consulting. So typically I do troubleshooting. In this situation, I need to quickly build up something that's not meant for a long, to run for a long time. Yeah, so I cannot come with my own big monitoring license, whatever solution, it takes a month before it starts running and then we have some data and can start analyzing. So yeah, I'm using the manager, I'm using uh, server statues for um, uh, Apache, and then a couple of scripts uh, that um, uh, do HTTP calls, pass data aus, out, uh, write them in CSV files, and run visualization on them. But it's, it's, uh, I'm not especially good in um, suggesting the latest and greatest uh, monitoring framework. I know a lot about the data and what, what, uh, what they are useful for, uh, but not about uh, the frameworks. Igor, we use um, Nagios to, to monitor using the similar setup to how he described. He didn't sort of put all the pieces together. But uh, uh, in the Tomcat wiki, there's a Perl script that you can use to, heh, there's a Perl script you can use to hit the JMX proxy. Uh, it will mutate the response into something that's acceptable for Nagios. And we use that all the time to sample a bunch of different things from any number of JVMs that we have running. But, but it's really important that you said proxy because the, the very basic, simple uh, Nagios uh, recipes, um, they have this check JMX script, script and, and, and this is problematic for performance reasons. As I said, um, if you're using JMX to connect, um, then don't start a JMX client for each uh, poll iteration you're doing. Yeah, uh, we usually use uh, Jolokia in our environments, which is quite neat, you can deploy it in most, um, I haven't had much trouble yet in most containers. Uh, and then again with uh, Nagios, it provides its own framework. It also has a shell, uh, so you can look at the, uh, as you've been explaining, uh, going through the Tomcat uh, mBeans, I've been following on my own local installation with Tomcat from Trunk and uh, uh, looking at the uh, at the single ambience, which is quite nice. So if you want to explore, this is a, this is a very nice interface. I very much recommend it. Um, I was actually just curious what you uh, or other people would have. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is my personal recommendation. So Holo Holokia, as it is pronounced, it's a chili, um, is, is very, very, very nice and very light. So you can, we just deploy it in every uh, Tomcat instance and we, uh, yeah use it everywhere. The URL is on, on the slides because I mentioned it also, yeah. More questions? No, so let's take probably a few minutes um, for some pictures. Uh, let's see where we have them. I need to find the right window, so probably here. Okay. Um, this is, I mean, this is uh, uh, nothing uh, very astonishing. I'm just showing some um, real pictures um, taken from the monitoring data that I um, suggested. Those pictures uh, might not look like what you expect. Uh, most people use RRD to store the data and to um, produce pictures. Um, actually, I must say, personally, I'm not a big fan of RRD because RRD disturbs data. RRD only works if data comes in in um, uh, perfect um, uh, uh, distances. Um, and what it does is, if your data comes in a few seconds early or late, it interpolates the data. It doesn't write the data that you gave to RRD, um, it, it um, interpolates the data to the point in time where it expected the data to arrive, and this interpolated data will be used to produce um, the pictures. And this is something I do not really like, because um, if um, your metrics change a lot over time, 
um, then this can um, introduce um, big errors. So this is just done, uh, for instance, by using GNUplot. Um, and um, it's a couple of pictures. The first picture on the left, um, that's uh, from the operating system, uh, MBIN, it's the CPU load. Um, ah, I see it's not all, why isn't it all on the, let's see whether we can improve the situation. Okay. Okay. Um, those pictures are taken um, during um, were were provide were, were are based on data uh, monitored during um, stress testing, and. Um, uh, the left is uh, the CPU load. Um, it was a four-node um, farm, and uh, to the right, um, uh, with the yellow color that goes to the right, um, it's the sum over the, the whole farm. So if you've got a farm, then the question is always, are you only looking at the individual nodes? Are you looking at maxima, at sums, at averages, and so on? Um, so we can see that we have a pretty steady CPU load. The right, picture to the right, um, that's the, 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 the system load, um, and um, the system load would also show whether there is some um, uh, other activity on the system that's not coming from our process. But there are no, no special uh, peaks here, so it's pretty much only our, our process running there. Free physical memory, um, this looks a bit strange. It looks like a leak and then it gives back memory, but if you know how operating systems use memory, um, typically they should not have free memory. They should use it for file system caching, for whatever they think um, they, can, they can make use of the memory. But if a process needs the memory, then they should free the file system caches or whatever they use the memory and give it to the process. So free physical memory is um, expected um, to go up and down and to be uh, not that high, um, it's only problematic if it gets really low. And remember, this is all taken from the JVM MBeans. This is not taken from any operating system based uh, measurement. File descriptors, so we can see um, that this um, application um, had about 500 um, file descriptors open per, per node. Um, there is some variation. Um, especially um, in, in, in the part um, at the end of the run. Um, garbage collection, the more interesting picture probably is that one. This is the garbage collection of the young generation, um, the one that um, collects Eden. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, we can see uh, which percentage of time this garbage collection takes. So it's about 2.5 or 3% of the time is taken by this garbage collection, which is okay in this um, special situation. On the right side, um, we can see how many garbage collections um, uh, per second um, we actually have garbage collections per second. We shouldn't have many per second. And actually, the, metri the, 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 the scale is uh, most uh, dots lie around um, 0 0.25. So this means we have about every four seconds a garbage collection. Yeah? And if, um, if we, we look at the upper and lower numbers, uh, we had between every three and five seconds a garbage collection, which is not, uh, I mean, in the young space, which is not too bad because the typical web application, a request should run half a second, a second, two seconds. So all of the request objects are, um, most of the request objects are typically um, collectible after a couple of seconds. So then we have um, some threat numbers here. Class loading, as I said, not very interesting, pretty stable. Um, compilation time, mostly zero, because after some stabilization, there is not much compilation going on. So only the upper images uh, provide interesting data. These were the platform MBeans, then we have the Tomcat MBeans. Um, this is um, thread pool information um, given in percentage, um, how many percent of the thread pool um, were busy, and we see that during this test run, we never exceeded 20%, and most of the time we were around 5%. Igor? Yes, I've got a question about the JIT. I was told by somebody, but it was uh, over beer, so I, I'm asking it now to you, uh, that after about 10,000 requests, uh, the JVM's JIT 
kicks in right. and uh, optimizes based on the request pattern for one, and or rather re-optimizes, recompiles based on the request pattern and based on what machine exactly it's running on. Is how can. Do, do you know? I, I cannot tell you much about uh, the patterns that you mean, but uh, yes, um, there is, first of all, um, uh, there's a, a client JVM and a server JVM, and those two have different um, limits. So um, the client JVM optimizes much earlier because it expects that the code is not, that, that it's more code that's not running that often, so it, the better pattern is to optimize more of it. And the server JVM waits a longer time before it kicks in. But um, those um, thresholds, like 10,000 or so, they are not really huge because um, under load, um, uh, a local method is uh, often called very frequently. So um, uh, it depends on, on, the, on which JVM you use. As, as always, everything is configurable. There are hundreds of, of settings, but this is typically not needed. OK, we've got the thread pool um, uh, usage, uh, thread creations. This is a session picture. So we can see that um, uh, during the stress test, more and more sessions were created until finally the, the login and the expiration rate stabilized and the session count didn't change anymore. Left side is um, logins, left, le right side is expirations, and we can see for some time logins is higher than expirations. That means we build up sessions and then it stabilizes. Request rates per second, about 60. Um, error rates on the right side, 0%. Average duration about 200 milliseconds, and it gets bad during the end of the run, and that was due to some external system not responding anymore in time. And on the right side, we see the concurrency, and the left and the right picture look very similar. That's because the throughput, the number of requests per second we put in, was, um, uh, was very stable over time. So if the, the response time goes up, the concurrency goes up as well. But it doesn't have to be like that. It could be that uh, the number of requests per second uh, go up, and then the concurrency might go up um, more than proportional. Yeah, probably that's, that's uh, enough since time is over. So I thank you for your patience, and um, happy monitoring.